Tonight I would simply like to ask you a question, and hopefully with the help of the Lord I'll aim to answer this question to some degree. How do you change the world? We're going to solve all the big problems tonight. Well, the short answer for the believer is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that Jesus came to this earth, he lived a sinless life and then took my place and paid my debt when he went to the cross. He died, was buried, but then rose again of his own power. And this message is the only thing that has the power to transform lives and change the world. Jesus was no ordinary man. You see, this was not just a good teacher. This was not just a prophet of God. But this was God Himself manifested in a body of flesh. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. What Jesus did He has committed that work to us to speak that word of life and reconciliation. And being aware of what Jesus did some 2,000 years ago is wonderful. But it must go beyond mere awareness and we must apply this good news, of course. And so how do we appropriate the gospel message, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, we do what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, of course. Then Peter said unto them, repent that is death, and be baptized, that is burial, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Everyone say resurrection power. Ladies and gentlemen, my friends, this is the only way to change the world. This message. This message. And if this is not our goal, as we seek to work with people, then we do them a disservice. I was speaking to somebody recently and they were just sharing a story of, of a church, of a preaching point, and I'm not indicting anybody, but just sharing this as an example. They were talking about how there was some new people coming to the church and then uh, an elder minister, an overseer, if you will, came alongside and said, you know, we should really talk about how we can get some of these new people in the baptistry and get them baptized and pray them through the Holy Ghost. And, and this well-intentioned minister, he said, you know, that's a really good idea. I, ha- I haven't really thought about how to do that. That is the goal. That is the purpose. As we are engaging people around us, we must keep at the forefront that the gospel message is the only thing that makes a difference. Good music in a beautiful sanctuary doesn't transform people. Fellowship and friendliness doesn't transform people. Benevolence and generosity in and of itself doesn't transform people. But only what Jesus has done can take a life that is bound in sin and destined for hell and give them an eternal hope and a blessed future. And if you believe that, can you say amen? It's only Jesus. It's only the gospel. So is it any wonder that the enemy seeks so desperately to keep people blind to this gospel message? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 and 3 that if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. The enemy seeks to blind the minds of unbelievers, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Hear me today and know that the devil works to keep people unaware and blissfully ignorant to the gospel because it's the only message that has the power to take somebody out of the kingdom of darkness and place them in the kingdom of God. The gospel is our message, but more than that, the gospel and the preaching of it is our mission. Everyone say the gospel. Now I will acknowledge tonight that the gospel that we preach, and hear me out, it is at least a little confrontational. It is a confrontational thing to suggest to somebody that they are a sinner in need of salvation. 
to suggest that the way they are living, even if it's pretty decent, is as filthy rags in the eyes of the Lord. To suggest that they have an eternal soul and that the implications of how they live their life and whether or not they serve God, these things matter eternally. And, and hearing the gospel for the first time, I've heard it likened to walking outside of a dark room on a sunny day and the light that you see is jarring and, and you grimace and you recoil and it feels abrasive, right? Well, it's very much the same with the gospel. If somebody has lived their entire life in darkness, when the light of the gospel shines to them for the first time, it likewise is jarring and it feels abrasive because it confronts the status quo of their life. And eventually, hopefully, with the help of God, they will realize that the light is better than the darkness, but the fact remains that the gospel, it is a confrontational truth. And so preaching the gospel is a matter that should be done wisely. You see, it's easy for me to say the gospel is the answer to the question how to change the world. That's the easy part. But it's a bit more nuanced than that because our preaching of it, there are ways that we can do it wisely and effectively. Sometimes this is a matter that needs to even be handled delicately, I might say. In Matthew 10, Jesus, he sends his disciples out and they're going to preach. And even Jesus says that, behold, I'm sending you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Sometimes in our preaching, we need to be sensitive. We need to be delicate. We need to handle it wisely to be effective. And this is not to suggest, Jesus is not saying, you know, harmless as doves. That's not to say that we should act in fearful timidness. We are called to preach with boldness. Amen? We're called to preach with boldness, but boldness is not the same as arrogance. And boldness is not the same as aggressiveness. And boldness is not shouting truth in people's faces. But boldness is a confidence. Boldness is an assurance in what you believe. That's true boldness. And yes, boldness can raise its voice at times when needed, but but boldness can also speak with quiet. We're wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. We have a powerful message today, and it's important that we handle it properly and preach it effectively. Understand that we wield a powerful weapon, the sword of the Spirit, which Paul said is the Word of God. And we understand that a sword in one person's hand, it can bring destruction like in times of warfare. But a sword in another person's hand can bring healing and help like a small scalpel in the hands of a surgeon. The writer of Hebrews says of the Word of God that the Word of God, it's alive and it's powerful. And and it is sharp. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. He said that the Word of God cuts between soul and spirit. It cuts between joint and marrow. And it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. And when I read a scripture like that, to me, that sounds more like a scalpel. A scalpel, an instrument that is used with precision and intention to bring healing and help to others. It's still a sword, but it's used with wisdom. A scalpel that cuts back the flesh to reveal hidden places. A scalpel that cuts away parts of us that are diseased. And and it's the same with the Word of God. I'm all for using the Word of God to cut down the kingdoms of darkness and and to push back the enemy and to push back hell. But when we're dealing with people, we use the Word of God like a scalpel. We're intentional, wise as serpents, harmless as doves. And I'm not saying that we should never use it. I'm not saying that we should keep it on the shelf. And I'm not saying that we should act timidly and keep our message and keep the sword in its sheath. I'm just saying that we must consider how we can effectively communicate this beautiful 
and yes, somewhat confrontational message and thereby change the world around us. So let me just say a couple of things. There's two main points, and I'll try to be brief. But how can we more effectively deliver the gospel to others and thereby change the world? Number one, and if you're taking notes, I would say, I would tell you to write down the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 He said that God also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Look at your neighbor and say, you're a minister. Some of you maybe didn't believe that, so just one more time, look at your neighbor and say, you're a minister. God has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Why? For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. God's Spirit can take our efforts of preaching the gospel and being ministers of the New Testament message and making disciples. And God's Spirit can cause us to be more effective and more fruitful. We know that Jesus said we'll receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon us. And this power will cause us to be witnesses. So we understand that our witness and our preaching, it must be empowered by the Spirit of God. That's ground zero. That's a great starting point. Our witness comes from the standpoint of us being filled with the Spirit of God. It's why Paul would say that my speech and my preaching, it was not just with enticing words of man's wisdom, but my speech and my preaching, it was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So we must have the Spirit of God when we preach this glorious gospel. Because our goal is to not just relay theology. Our goal is to not just win biblical arguments with people. When we are preaching the Word of God and sharing this message, we must make room for God to demonstrate His power. We must leave room for God to flow. And not just be so concerned with our three points or our Bible study lesson. But during our witness, when we feel a prompting to pray, guess what we ought to do? We ought to stop right there and we ought to pray. When we feel a check in our spirit, when we feel a witness in the Holy Ghost to just pause and say, hey, we need to let God move for a few moments, then we ought to pause right up and pray a prayer and let God move. That's why we're doing it in the first place, to let God impact their life. When we feel to speak a prophetic word, when we feel to speak something uh, over the person that we're witnessing to, then let it fly. I believe that God's going to minister in your family. I believe that God's going to heal that body. I believe that God is going to supply for the need that you have. You have the ability to do that because you are a spirit-filled believer and God wants to flow like that through you. Amen? We can operate in more than just biblical content and persuasive speech as apostolic believers because there is a power within us that flows through us. And I still believe that God can do more in just one moment than we could achieve through a 12-week Bible study course. And I believe in 12-week Bible study courses. I'm teaching one right now. It's turning out to be a 12-month Bible study course, but nonetheless, it's a 12-week Bible study. Praise the Lord. I'm saying tonight that we ought to be willing to flow in the Spirit and not quench it when we feel the prompting to do so. Because we must be Spirit-filled in our preaching and in our witness. Another element uh, in, in the Spirit of God being with us and being present in our preaching, I would say that we must have Spirit-led preaching and Spirit-led witness as we engage our world with this gospel message. In John chapter 4, when Jesus perceived that there was just one woman in Samaria who was thirsty for living water, he took an uncommon and an undesirable route to Galilee that day. And John wrote in John 4 verse 4 that he must needs go to Samaria. I call that spirit-led evangelism. Spirit-led evangelism. Yes, Jesus often ministered to multitudes, but he was compelled that day in particular to go to a specific spot where he knew that there was one thirsty soul. 
Now, that was Jesus. That was God in the flesh. And you say, well, of course he knew to go there. He's omniscient. He's God. But this is not just for Jesus. There are others, people, just like you and I in the book of Acts that were led in just the same way. In Acts chapter 8, there's Philip. An angel told Philip to get up and start walking south. No other direction other than that. Get up, go south, through a desert terrain no less. But why? The reason is because there was an Ethiopian eunuch that was reading the scripture and is needing greater revelation. And Philip, if you will just walk that direction, then I will intersect your life with somebody who is hungry. Spirit-led evangelism. There's Ananias in the next chapter, Acts chapter 9. And the Bible says that the Lord spoke to Ananias in a vision. Everyone say, the Lord spoke. The Lord spoke. And if you read through, I'll paraphrase, God said, Ananias, go to this street and make your way to this house and ask for a man by the name of Saul. And Ananias, let me tell you what, Saul is praying to me right now. I've got Saul on the other line over here. And I'm going to send you to Saul. It's like divine dispatch, you know. God is saying, I want you to go to where this man is. This guy named Saul. And so he does. And not only does Saul receive his physical sight, but he also receives spiritual sight when Ananias went and laid his hands on him and prayed for him that he might receive the Holy Ghost. That is spirit-led evangelism. The next chapter, Peter. He has the same vision three times in Acts chapter 10. And the Bible says that meanwhile, as Peter was puzzling over the vision, the Holy Spirit said to him, three men have come looking for you. So I'm going to say the Lord spoke. The Lord speaks to Peter and he says, get up, go downstairs and go with them without hesitation. Don't worry, for I have sent them. And so Peter goes and Peter preaches. And as a result, a devout man named Cornelius hears the gospel. He and his family are filled with the Holy Ghost and they get baptized. This is spirit-led evangelism. And in each of these three cases, God had been working. God's Spirit had already been leading these people and moving on their hearts. They were hungry. They were hungry for, and they were in need of something more than what they had. And so God found a man. God found a person to go and preach the gospel. I'll tell us tonight that we need to pray. And I hope that you pray this every day. I make it my aim to do so. God, lead me to an individual that is hungry for what I have. Lord, lead me. Prompt me. Quicken me. At the drop of a hat, at any given moment, Lord, lead me. I I think it's an order that we pray, God, order my steps. Order my steps. I don't want to just pray that selfishly, Lord, lead me to the next promotion. Lord, lead me to the next blessing. But Lord, lead me to somebody who's hurting and hungry. Order my steps, Lord. There's a story in the Old Testament in 1 Samuel chapter 9 and a different Saul, Saul of Saul, the first king of Israel before he became king. He was on a mission to find some lost donkeys that belonged to his father. And, and so his father, Kish, sends him on this mission. Everyone say a mission. He was on a mission to find these donkeys, and and his father had sent a servant with Saul to help him on the journey. And so Saul starts looking, he goes to many different places over three days, but has no success, and he is no closer to achieving the goal. And so Saul is now frustrated, and he's tired, and so he turns and he starts talking to the servant that his father gave him, and he says, I'm done. I want to go home. I'm giving up. I don't care anymore. My father's probably more concerned about me and about us than he is about the donkeys. And so we're, we're, we're throwing in the towel here. He says this to his servant. But when Saul started talking to his servant, the servant started talking back to him. And the servant started suggesting that they go and they talk to Samuel the prophet. And so Saul says, okay, I guess we might as well try. And once they went and they found Samuel, the problem was solved. And Samuel says, hey guys, the donkeys you were looking for, they've been found. 
they're already back with your father. Problem solved, mission accomplished, and you didn't have to do anything but find the man of God. But that was a suggestion that came from the servant that Saul's father gave to him for the mission. Can I tell us tonight that we also have been given a mission by our Heavenly Father and to aid us in fulfilling this great commission, God has given us a helper. It's called the Holy Ghost. It's the Spirit of God that works within us and flows through us. We need the working of the Spirit and the leading of the Spirit. And if we try to do the will of our Father in our own strength, we will end up like Saul did. We will end up weary and frustrated and spent in our own strength. But if we will let the Spirit speak to us, if we'll start talking to God, God will start talking to us. And if we'll say, hey God, I need a little bit of direction here. I need you to lead me, Lord. Order my steps today. Lead me to somebody hungry and hurting that I can help, that I can preach to. We will... We will achieve the will of our Father more effectively. Amen? I find it interesting, the the, the examples I just referenced, Jesus and Ananias and Philip and Peter. Jesus went and ministered to that woman that day at the well. But He wasn't weary when He ministered. In fact, it refreshed Him. It refreshed Him. He said to His disciples in Verse 32 of John 4, he said, I have meat that you know not of. He had sent them to McDonald's to buy cheeseburgers. John 4 verse 8 says that, I think, something like that. So they had gone to get food, and so that's when he ministers to the woman at the well. And they come back just as he's kind of wrapping up, you know, talking to this woman. And he says this, I have, I have meat, I have food, I have sustenance that you know not of. And they go, who brought Jesus food? Did you? He got food from somebody else. Why would he send us to get food? And then he says in verse 34, my meat, my food, my sustenance is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Jesus went like a laser beam, like a guided missile to this one woman at the well. And as a result of being led by the Spirit of God to this one individual, he wasn't weary when he was finished. He was refreshed. That's the beauty and the benefit of spirit-led evangelism, being being led by the Spirit, knowing His voice and doing what He says. If Ananias had to knock on every door in Damascus, he would have been tired. But he went to a specific house, one door, doing the will of God. If Philip had to wander aimlessly through the desert, he would have grown weary, but he was sent a specific direction. If Peter had to get up and go with every person who came knocking at his door or every person that called his cell phone, if he had to just move at every whim of every person, then ministry would have worn him out. But the Spirit told him to get up and go with these certain men. And as a result, he did the will of God and wasn't weary on the other side. God may lead us in that kind of way. And when we engage in spirit-led, spirit-filled evangelism, ministering to somebody as the Lord prompts us, then we won't grow weary in well-doing. I'm not saying that we shouldn't spend ourselves at times, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't give it our all, but I'm just saying that it is imperative and it's very important that we walk with the leading of the voice of God. And God may lead us in the supermarket to share our witness, our testimony with somebody in particular. It may come as a prompting to pray for a need in somebody's life. And rather than just saying, well, I'll pray for you. Say, no, let's pray right now. Can I lay my hands on you? I believe that God's going to heal you right now in Jesus' name. And you pray. It's being willing to move like that when we hear God speak. Now here's the caveat, and I'm moving quickly to my second point. Remember, there's only two points in the sermon. Here's the caveat. I'm not saying that we should never scatter the seed of God's Word. That's biblical too. Jesus told the parable of the sower, and you know, the word sower, it means scatterer. I mean, literally, this, this young man, this individual, he just, just, just threw the seed, which is the Word of God. Jesus tells his disciples. He just scattered it everywhere with no regard for where it was going to land. So that is biblical. 
Only some of the ground was good ground. Only some of the ground received the seed and produced a harvest. So it's biblical today to scatter the seed of the Word of God. And it's biblical to preach the gospel to every creature and not pick and choose who we witness to. That's true. But with that said, I also believe that alongside that mentality, God wants to partner with us. And God wants to lead us like a Holy Ghost guided missile to somebody upon whom God is already working. Their heart is already good soil. The fallow ground of their heart has already been tilled up by God's Spirit and all they need is for somebody who is sensitive to the voice of God to go to them and plant the seed of God's Word in their heart. If we want to change the world by the power of the Gospel, then we must not underestimate the importance of being full of the Spirit of God and being led by the Spirit of God. In John 6, Jesus said that no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Which tells me that there are people even tonight, even right now as I'm preaching, there is somebody today in the city of Fredericton, in your community, in your sphere of influence, that the Lord and the Spirit of God is already drawing. He's already working on them. And Lord, my prayer is that you would help me to be sensitive and be led to people like that. I want to know His voice. And I want to go where He tells me. So first, yes... I want to say the Spirit of God. If we want to preach this gospel effectively, we must have the Spirit of God with us, filling us, and leading us. But the second thing that I would like to hone in on for the remaining time that we have tonight, a critical and key component in preaching the gospel is love. Love. Love must be the thing. Love must be the force that undergirds our every effort in reaching and changing the world. I think I'm in a room tonight and, and many under the sound of my voice would likely agree with me when I say that I believe that the Acts 2.38 message is the only message that leads to salvation. I believe that Jesus is not one of many ways. I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. I believe that. I believe that except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The words of Jesus himself. I'm thankful tonight for the apostles' doctrine. I'm thankful that the more that I study this these beautiful truths, the more that I study the new birth experience, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it doesn't shoot holes in my theology. It solidifies my theology. The more I study, the more I am persuaded. The more I study, the more firm my footing is on the Word of God. I believe it more as I dig deeper, not less. I'm thankful for truth. I'm thankful for the words of Jesus and for the example of the first century church, I believe this message. And I've said this already, and I've alluded to this already, but, but allow me to say again that it is possible to have truth. It is possible to have the right message, but then wield it improperly. And, and to use a weapon that, yes, can be used as a weapon of warfare against hell but use it that way against people and take truth and then bludgeon them with it. It's possible. I'm not saying that we, we do this. I'm not, I'm not saying that this is our MO. I'm just saying that it's possible. We can wield the sword of God's Word and if done with a wrong spirit, we can turn people away. Ephesians chapter 4.15, Paul said, powerful statement, Instead, we will speak the truth in love. How many are grateful for truth today? I'm thankful for the truth of God's Word, and I'm thankful for the Gospel message. And I want to speak it, but let us speak it in love. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of His body, the church. Now ponder this with me for a few moments. If, if you wanted to motivate somebody 
or, or compel someone to act in a certain way? How would you do it? How would you achieve your desired end goal? You know, I, I have the image in my head tonight. It's like the proverbial carrot that dangles in front of the horse, you know. It's motivation to move forward, right, for the horse, for the mule. So, but, but, but what do we, what do we use? What implement do we use to try to motivate people to, to act a certain way or to achieve a certain end? Now, motivation, it can come in many different forms. Companies and corporations, they understand the value of motivated workers, which is why they implement incentive structures amongst their employees. Perhaps an automatic pay raise when you hit a certain performance threshold or a number of years with the company. Some people are paid by commission, compelling them to make another sale. Sometimes companies will give away free vacations or a paid day off to the highest performer. Incentives are strong motivators. You can turn a lazy person into a hard worker real quick with the right motivation. They will make those extra cold calls or they will, they will talk to a few extra customers on the sales floor if they are motivated properly. Now, now here are just a few ways that I think you can motivate a person. Of course, there's, there's barter or trade. I mean, that's why you go to work in the morning. It's, it's barter. It's, you know, you do this for me and I'll do this for you. You work this shift and I'll pay you this much hourly wage. I'll pay you this salary annually if you come. That's barter. That's trade. You do this and I'll do that. And our entire economic system is built upon this whole idea. And I can compel someone to action with the right amount of money. Oh yeah. The right amount of goods. I'll give you a cookie if uh, whatever. <laughs> then there's bribery. Now, you might think that going to, you know, that's how your, you know, your boss is bribery to get you to come to work. Bribery is the same as barter, except it crosses ethical or legal lines, so we'll try to stay away from that. There's guilt. Guilt, like in a verb tense, I'm going to guilt you, right? It's the act of making someone feel guilty in order to induce behavior. Well, I hope you can make it to the family barbecue. Notice you didn't make it last time. I'll be there. That's a strong motivator at times. It can be used to achieve your desired end, but it's not the best one, I don't think. There's blackmail or extortion, demanding something from a person in exchange for not revealing compromising information about them. There's fear. Fear is a strong motivator. Through threats of an undesired circumstance or end result, you can compel somebody to act with fear. They will become afraid of what might happen, and so they move. There's pushiness. Come on, come on. And, and because you just won't relent, and because you refuse to leave somebody alone, sometimes they'll reluctantly agree to your wishes. You know, this is just a side note. I, I, I'm persuaded. I heard this one time that you can push somebody to do something, and they may do it, but just by virtue of you pushing somebody, You've created distance between you and them. So is that the strongest, best motivator? I don't think so. If you had a desired goal, what would you use? What do you use? Now allow me to insert here that God also has a desired goal. Peter said that the Lord is not slack concerning His promise. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. It is God's will and God's desired and goal that sinners in this world find a place of repentance. God's will is that everybody experience this. God's desire is for people to come to a place where they respond to the gospel and they turn their lives to Him. Repentance is powerful and it is for everybody it's not just feeling sorry for sin. It's making a choice that God's way is better. And so as a result, I'm going to follow Him. It's a change of direction. It's an about face. It's a full 180. It's not perfection, but it's perfecting. That's repentance. And we celebrate when people are baptized. And we celebrate when people receive the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. But, but I think we also ought to celebrate the things that God celebrates. I say unto you, Jesus said that likewise joy shall be in heaven over just one sinner 
that repenteth. More than over 90 and 9 just persons which need no repentance. And so when somebody recognizes that their way isn't working and they decide to surrender to God and give their all to Him, heaven rejoices. And I say we ought to rejoice too when just one sinner comes to an altar, bows their knee, and bows their will in the presence of God. Amen. And So if repentance is God's will and that's the goal, what does God do? to motivate people to this end. God could use many things. He could guilt us. He could push us into serving Him. He could bribe us with blessings. He could blackmail us with our past. Or He could scare us with hell. But He doesn't. In His wisdom, God knows that there is a force that exists that is so much more effective than any of these. And that force is love. Love is the thing that ought to undergird everything we do as people of God. Love is the force that should undergird us as we go into this world and preach the gospel gospel of Jesus Christ. There is nothing more persuasive. There is nothing more powerful than love. Paul would say this in Romans 2 verse 4. He said, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? Are you going to presume upon these, these things? Don't you know that the goodness of God, other translations, the kindness of God, just love. Don't you know that these lead us to repentance? Hear me and know that God extends his hand of goodness and kindness to sinners and to us. All in an effort to motivate us and to compel us, to compel people to repent. It's his love in action. And if God in His sovereignty shows us that kindness is the tool of choice in bringing people to repentance, why why in our right mind would we ever try to choose anything different than what God uses? It's kindness. It's goodness. It's love. Our love for others and our kindness toward them, I'll say it this way, it's the grease for the gospel. Kindness and love is the grease for the gospel. To quote the wisdom of Mary Poppins, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And as cliche as it may be to say, people don't care how much you know. They don't care about the message that you have until they know how much you care. You have the most important message that people could ever hear And your best opportunity to share it with them, I believe, will be through a door opened by your goodness and your kindness. Now, I'm coming in for a close very quickly. I would state the contrary, and I would just play devil's advocate for a moment. I don't know if I'm allowed to do that in the pulpit, but I will. To state the contrary, I know what Jude said. I know that Jude said in Jude 1.23, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. I got it. Hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. But let me just just ask a question and and ask, who is it that, that Jude is suggesting have fear? Who is to have the fear? The believer or the unbeliever? That's my question. If we had a believer and an unbeliever standing right up here on either side of me, and Jude is addressing... The church, he's addressing believers here. Is he saying that we should use fear as a tactic to persuade unbelievers? Or is he saying that the believer should have godly fear within them? Now, if you back up one verse, verse 22, Jude says, and of some have compassion making a difference. Now, that one's easy. That's really easy. Who has compassion, the believer or the unbeliever? The believer has compassion. And because the believer has compassion, they make a difference. But for other believers, maybe, maybe in some circumstances, the believer ought to be motivated with a godly fear. A fear of what might happen to that sinner if you don't intervene, if you don't preach. And that godly fear, that is what motivates you to pull them out of the fire. So, so Jude is not, I don't, I don't believe that Jude 
is, is contending here that we should dangle hell over unbelievers and say, you know, be afraid, be very, very afraid. Jude is saying that sometimes you have compassion and you make a difference. Jude says sometimes there's a godly fear that wells up within you and you pull them out of those flames. Those flames put, put, put something in you. They stir something in you to, to reach out into your world. And so I suggest that in both verse 22 and verse 23, it's the believer who is motivated at times by compassion and at times by fear. It was Noah in Hebrews 11 who moved with fear to build the ark. Noah had already found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was already walking with God. The believer in this context and in this case was the one who was moved with fear to prepare a vessel of safety and to preach righteousness to the people. It doesn't say that he moved others with fear. It says that he was moved with fear. The man who had found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so I just asked the question, who is to have fear? Are, are we supposed to make unbelievers afraid of hell and afraid of torment, thus motivating them to repent? Is that what we're supposed to do? And I don't believe that that is the message of Scripture predominantly. And yes, I know that Jesus talked more about hell than anybody else in the Bible. That is true. But if you study His teachings on hell, Jesus predominantly didn't talk about hell to unbelievers. Rather, he spoke about hell to his disciples and to religious people. Not exclusively, but predominantly. You can, you can study that and you can look at all the places where he talks about it. He spoke about hell to disciples and to religious people. He spoke about hell to believers likely in an effort to motivate them to reach for unbelievers. The fire of hell, yes, it ought to put the fear of God in somebody. I say more than anybody, it ought to put the fear of God in us so that we will reach for others and pull them out of those flames. Music, join me, I'm finishing. Jesus would sometimes address the crowds and he would teach on hell through a parable. True. But then, like in the case of Matthew 13, he would get alone with his disciples later. And he would explain the parable in greater detail and use the gritty language that we're familiar with, weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where the worm dieth not and the flame is not quenched. He, he would use that kind of language often and predominantly with his disciples. And I'm not trying to draw a hard line here. I'm not, I'm not saying that we should never talk about hell to a sinner. Even Jesus did it at times to crowds. But if we do talk about it, if we do talk about eternity separated from the presence of God, let it be from a place of love, a place of kindness and genuine care for that soul. What makes us effective in preaching the gospel? How, how do we truly change the world? What motivates people to respond when we share it? Number one, the Spirit of God. Being filled by it, being led by it. Truth. But secondly, I would say our kindness and our goodness goes a long way. We can't underestimate that either. Jesus said this, a few verses. Let your light so shine before men. Preach the gospel. Synonymous command. Let your light shine. That's powerful. But what is it that people actually see? Well, the next, phrase, the next phrase, that they may see your good works. Your good works, that's what they see. And as a result, they glorify your Father, which is in heaven. When preaching to Cornelius' house, Peter was preaching Jesus to them. He was talking about the crucified Savior, the crucified Lord, the resurrected Lord. And I, I want you to listen to how Peter, the Pentecost preacher, summed up Jesus' ministry in Acts 10.38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good. He went about doing good. And healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. Don't underestimate doing a kind deed, speaking a kind word, not speaking harshly or arrogantly. Don't underestimate that's the power in that. One of my favorite biblical characters is Barnabas, and his name means son of encouragement. And Barnabas, he was the one who advocated for Saul of Tarsus, the new convert, when the apostles were hesitant. 
Barnabas was the one who advocated for John Mark, the wandering young minister, when Paul wanted to write him off. He was a good man. This Barnabas, always encouraging others, living up to his name. Seemingly just a very kind person. And the Bible gives him this epitaph in Acts chapter 11, verse 24. For he was a good man. He was a good man. Full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added to the Lord. Good man. Went about doing good. That they might see your good works. I'm all, I'm all for preaching. and I'm all for, for boldness and authority. And, and, and I want God to lead us. But I just don't, I don't want us to forget the importance of doing good to others and being kind. It's the grease for the gospel. One of the greatest presidents, my closing illustration here tonight, one of the greatest presidents of the United States was without question Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln led through the Civil War and he certainly had the opportunity to speak harshly to those under him, but this was not his way. His generals, each one in turn, would blunder tragically and they would drive Lincoln to pace the floor and so he would replace them one after the other. Half the nation would condemn these incompetent generals. But Lincoln, to quote a statement he made, with malice towards none and with charity for all, would hold his peace. And when Mrs. Lincoln, his wife, and others spoke harshly of the southern people, the Confederate army, Lincoln replied, don't criticize them. They are just what we would be under similar circumstances that's a great statement don't criticize them they are just what we would be under similar circumstances but for the grace of God the battle of Gettysburg was fought during the first three days of July in 1863 and during the night of July 4th General Lee of the south began to retreat southward but when he reached the Potomac River, River with his defeated army he found a swollen, impassable river in front of him and a victorious Union army behind him. Lee was in a trap. The army of the South couldn't escape, and Lincoln saw that. So here was a golden, heaven-sent opportunity to capture Lee's army and end the Civil War immediately. And so Lincoln ordered his then-general, Meade, via telegraph and a special messenger, to not call a council of war, but just attack Lee immediately. Just move. And what did General Meade do? He did the very opposite. He called the council of war. He hesitated. He procrastinated. And as a result, the enemy escaped and the war continued. So Lincoln was furious. As you can imagine, victory was within reach. But his general, he blundered. And so he wrote this letter to General Meade. My dear general, I do not believe you appreciate... Now, I'll pause. This sounds pretty tame, but this was, this was fierce for Lincoln. Okay? I do not believe you appreciate the magnitude of this misfortune involved in Lee's escape. He was within our easy grasp. And to have closed upon him would, in connection with our other late successes, have ended the war. As it is, the war will be prolonged indefinitely. If you could not safely attack Lee last Monday, how can you possibly do so south of the river when you can take with you very few, no more than two-thirds of the force you had then in hand? It would be unreasonable to expect, and I do not expect that you can now effect much. Your golden opportunity is gone, and I am distressed immeasurably because of it. Now what do you suppose General Meade did when he read this letter? Fierce and vehement, for Lincoln, someone of his temperament. Well, Meade never saw the letter. Lincoln never mailed it. It was found among Lincoln's papers after his death. Let me just say tonight, and I feel the Lord in this point, it is really easy to criticize and condemn. It's really easy to be aggressive and abrasive. It's really easy to push and prod people but this rarely motivates or compels them to aspire to more. Why didn't Lincoln mail the letter? 
because somewhere along the way he had learned that sharp condemnation and rebuke almost invariably ended in futility. And so with malice towards none and with charity for all, Lincoln led with kindness and consideration and he became one of the most influential and beloved presidents of our neighbors to the south. His picture would hang over the desk in the Oval Office and future presidents, when they were facing a situation or a conundrum, they would look at his, at his likeness and at, at his painting and they would say, what would Lincoln do if he were alive today? How do you change the world? The gospel, yes. But how do you preach the gospel well? With the help of God's Spirit and with a good dose of kindness, goodness, and love. Can you stand together with me? I want to pray over us before we leave. This is how it's done. This is how you make a difference. The Spirit of God and the love of God as we seek to preach this glorious gospel. Let's pray together. Lord, if you'd raise your hands for just a moment. Lord, I'm so thankful that the gospel came into my life. And Lord, you have called each of us to preach the gospel. It's the great commission. It's not for a select few. It's a common call to all believers, to all men and women under the sound of my voice to go into the highways and the byways, to go into the highways and the hedges, to compel them to come, to go and to preach the gospel to every creature. And Lord, I'm just asking tonight that for me in my life, I'll pray it at least for me and I pray it for everybody here, that you would remind me again the importance of taking some time to listen for your voice, taking some time to hear and to heed where you are leading me, God. So Lord, I pray, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. Let her hear where God is leading, Lord. Lead us to a hungry heart. Lead us to that hungry soul, I pray. And Lord, as we go, I pray that there will be a fresh baptism of the love of God. I pray that there will be a fresh baptism of kindness and consideration, goodness and love to our fellow man. God, I pray that you'd help us to realize tonight that, that this is something that, that we need to be wise as serpents, harmless as doves at times. God, help us not to unintentionally push somebody away with this beautiful message. God, I pray that you'd help us to realize the importance of love tonight. If we have not love, we're just a tinkling brass, a sounding cymbal. We're just noise in an ever-crowded world. But if there is love, we can move mountains. If there is love, we can see lives transform. If there is love that abounds as we declare your word, I believe that you can save another Saul of Tarsus. God, I believe that you can turn another Cornelius and his family around. God, I believe you can do it through your people today. Can you just raise your voice? Can you raise your hands? And can you just pray in the Holy Ghost for a few minutes? I just believe that God wants to endue us with that tonight. That God wants to bring revelation and understanding tonight.